stay with TRT World. The news continues right after Showcase. Today's homemade edition of Showcase looks at how artists are responding to the killing of George Floyd. When singer, songwriter and rapper John Jupiter heard that a police officer killed George Floyd on May the 25th, this was his response. Hey, this is for George Floyd. George! This is for life you destroyed. Good. This is for mothers and sisters and grandmas and cousins that cry for their boy. Ooh. You left us no options no more. Yeah, I hope you rock for that choice. Yeah, you put a lock on the door. But niggas ain't knocking no more. Yeah, you done fed up now. Yeah, you gonna burn the fed down. Yeah, you gonna turn it back now. I'm joined by John Jefferson now. Hi, John. Good to see you. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you so yeah. much. So, tell me about the song. When did you decide, at, one po at what point did you decide to uh, make a song about um, George Floyd? Yeah, so um, the song I made is called George Floyd. And uh, to be honest, uh, this is an issue that I've felt strongly about my whole life. You know, I, I, I'm a uh, black American. So um, just to sit back and have to watch all the atrocities against my people and my race and uh, not really have a voice or a say in it all uh, is really disheartening. Mm -hmm. And I have a natural talent. I've been given a natural gift to be able to tell a story through music and make people really feel that story. You know, and the times are interesting now where everybody's out in the streets and they're protesting and we're really trying to have our voices heard. But I'm in a unique situation where I can't be in the streets because my wife is nine months pregnant, right? Um, and that makes her, uh, or she, she's, when you're pregnant, you're more susceptible to like a uh, disease or anything uh, because your immune system is lower. So I can't be out in the streets, especially during these COVID times protesting. So I d decided to use my voice to make my message heard mm -hmm. uh, and try to spread that out to as many people as possible to let people know that we're really ready for change. You know, it's time for change. Uh, so do you remember the moment you found out about the killing? How did it make you feel when you first found out about it? Yeah, so uh, it's funny. I was uh, actually in the studio recording other music. I have a home studio here, so I was recording other music. And uh, I, I was actually late um, to the video of the killing and everything, but a friend texted me about it, and he says, uh, stay safe in the streets. Things are going crazy. And after being in the studio for so long, I, I didn't even know what was happening. And I checked my phone, and uh, you know, I went to Twitter, and I saw the video, and it was... Uh, uh, that was the day. It was, it was a day after the actual killing. I saw the video, and uh, it was it, it it hurt to see, you know, just yeah. just the uh, utter disregard for life. It hurt to see. So, yeah. yeah. And you also played him in your music video, and you reenacted the scene where he was lying yeah. uh, on the concrete. How did yes. it make you feel? Wow. So uh, to have to reenact that scene. First off, you know, the uh, a song or video video that you would like to not to have to make, you know? Um, and it, it, was, uh, it was tough because my wife actually recorded the video. So here she is nine months pregnant, she's bent over. You know, she's gonna have a black son. She's gonna bring, bring a black American son into this world, you know? And for her to have to record the video and watch it and, and, and I believe I played the part really well. I really sold the part. And, uh, you know, it's good for the video since, but for her and the feelings that she went through, it's still tough uh, for her to this day to watch that video because it is a reality for anybody who looks like me and, and her son who's on the way, you know, so it was tough. And then if you can only imagine uh, being there laying down on the concrete, the concrete is hot, it's dirty, it's disgusting. You know, and I laid and we did, we took, you know, six to seven different takes. So I'm laying there on the concrete, all sorts of dirt and grime and my face hurts and I have scratches. Just to lay there is demoralizing. So, so to go out of the world in that way, you know, almost like you're nothing, uh, it hurts and it's something that we don't want to have to see again. Definitely. And um, 
the Floyd protests spread across the globe like no other previous protests. Yeah. Why do you yes. think that was the case? What, what, what do you think um, uh, caused that? You know what? Uh, I think um, the reason that's happening because at this moment, everybody has the time. You know, uh, coronavirus uh, is spread is something that we're all so afraid of, uh, rightfully so. You know, or not necessarily afraid. We're taking cautious measures. So the world is kind of on a hiatus at this moment, and everybody has the time. So if you, uh, uh, in in the sense of white supremacy, uh, they chose the wrong time. They chose the wrong time to kill another black person in that way, because now the world has the time and the world's listening, and we're all here together. And it, it's it's beautiful to see the camaraderie, not the death, but it's beautiful to see the camaraderie that came about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, strong words, uh, just like your lyrics. I guess I really want to talk <laughs> about the lyrics for a while. Obviously, yeah. there is a lot of anger there. Uh, I wonder, what do you think is the role of music in a in a protest like this? And what was your aim with this song? Wow. Um, that's a big one because, uh, you know, if you think about it, everything that we do in life revolves around music. Literally everything. If you want to watch a movie, there's music in the background. If you want to work out, you're playing music. If you want to dance, you're playing music. Everything that you do in life, I think uh, music is the heartbeat of life, right? So uh, songs can evoke uh, emotion. And it's funny that you talk about uh, anger because I just want to make it clear that anger is separate from hate. You know, you can be angry out of love, right? I have love for my people, and it makes me angry to see these atrocity, atrocities continue, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted uh, the song, I wanted everybody to be able to feel the song and feel the emotion and really watch what it looks like to, to really see somebody in, in clear HD struggle for their lives, you know? Oh, uh, I, in the music video, I'm kind of struggling for breath you know, as I'm uh, doing the song. So I wanted that, uh, I want the song to be able to power, to be able to empower people when they hear it. Yeah. I mean, this really makes me think about how much of this song and your response to what's been going on is personal and how much of it is political, really. And mm -hmm. is it really possible to distinguish between the two? Yeah. Um, so it's funny, the use of the word political, um, I think what people need to understand is that politics end when we're talking about actual lives, right? There are some issues in this world that are political. Uh, you know, how much taxes should we be paying? That's politics, right? Um, uh, issues that, that aren't uh, directly affecting life or death in this moment. This isn't political. It's personal for me, and it should be personal for every human being on this planet, right? So um, I think it, this, this one is a lot less political and it's more so, hey, we need our lives. Stop taking our lives from us. This is life or death. This can happen to me. It can happen mm -hmm. to my son. It can happen to anyone I know that looks like me. This is life or death. It's not politics. Stop killing us and let us thrive. Not just stop killing us. That's just, that's what you should be doing anyway, right? We shouldn't <laughs> have to die, right? Let us thrive in this community. Give us. Throw us some bones. Let us thrive as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you mentioned a few times, and you also mentioned in the song that you have a baby on the way, which is just yes. great. Congratulations yeah. already. But Thank I really hope that he won't have to deal with all these issues uh, in his lifetime. But do you think that is likely? How hopeful are you about the future? <sighs> That's a great question. Um, I think in my son's children's lifetime, I do believe that people that look like me will be uh, much more equal in a sense. I do believe we're going to be integrated into, you know, uh, high positions in our American society, CEOs, and we're going to have wealth as well. I, I don't believe it'll be here in my son's generation, but in his children's generation, I do believe it will. But, but, it's important that we start the fight now, right this moment, to make that so. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate yeah. your time. Yes. Thank you so much. The death of George Floyd 
greatly impacted our next guest. Nicholas Smith's art, seen here on his Instagram account, captures today's uprising against the police in America. Let's go to Los Angeles, where Nicholas Smith joins me now. Hi, Nicholas. Hello, how's it going? Good, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. So your paintings about Black Lives Matter uh, went viral on social media, not only on social media, but especially on social media. So uh, tell us the story behind them. How did you come up with them? Well, uh, for the past seven years, I've been creating uh, what I call a Sunday sketch. Every Sunday, I create a new art piece. And really, it started from a low place in my life, just as therapy, trying to, you know, pull myself out of what I was going through. And I, it turned into really looking at the world and trying to reflect what is happening. Um, there's a Nina Simone quote that says, it's an artist's duty to reflect the times. And that's what I like to do with my art. And so often in America, there are these senseless tragedies that occur where um, black lives are taken, lives are murdered by police, unfortunately. And um, I, I started creating tributes with my art to just really try to give a voice to the voiceless, to those people who cannot speak for themselves anymore. And just to try to show that, you know, black lives matter, black lives are important and these lives should still be here. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you uh, about your work, of course, uh, the aesthetic side of your work, but then you quoted Nina Simone saying that it's an artist's duty to reflect times. I want to just talk about that. Why do you think that is the case uh, yeah. with you? Do you think that, do you want to uh, make people do something, protest, think, or etc. Yes, I think that's that was part of, of the reason why she why Nina Simone said this because you know I feel like if, if an artist can reflect what's going on in the world, um, that art can have the power to make people you know, create some sort of positive change and that's what I want to do. Uh, what I call what I call it is artivism. Mm -hmm. It's like art and activism in a way of really trying to get people to do something in a positive manner um, after they see the art that was created. And so a lot of my art um, will have kind of a, a go-to, an action item, something that people can do. Um, for instance, uh, I created a piece for Ahmaud Arbery after he was killed, and it said, text justice to this cell phone number. and when people did that, they can put themselves on a petition and really help to fight for real change. And so one thing is the looking at the art and appreciating it. And then there's the next step of trying to really get people to go out there and say, I saw this art and, and that reminded me of this very real thing that I can do to try to, you know, change what is happening in this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an artist who believes in the power of artivism, especially in troubled times like these, how do you feel when you see your work show up on protesters' signs? Well, it is, it's a surreal feeling. I, I did not expect any of this to, to go as viral as it did. And I'm, I'm just really thankful that, you know, people feel like, that my art speaks to them and that it can in a way help them shout out to the world that black lives are important mm -hmm. um it's it's really you know i i can't believe just to see people like janet jackson and michelle obama and all these people with these huge platforms who are wanting to speak out first about you know the importance of black lives but then also to use my art to do it it just it's a phenomenal thing. Mm. And tell us about your technique as well, please. Yes, yeah, so my, a lot of my, the majority of my uh, Sunday sketches are digital paintings. Um, so it's almost like sketching in a notebook, but you have a digital pen instead of, you know, an actual pen. And so I 
what I what I do is I give myself anywhere from 30 minutes to say three hours every Sunday, and I you know just sketch in Photoshop with my Wacom tablet, and I create more of a what I want to create is um what looks like a abstract or semi-abstract oil painting, very textured, gritty. And my style is unfinished, um, which in a way is a parallel to these lives that did not get a chance to finish, did not get a chance to live out their full life. Um, so there's sometimes there's a lot of really um, emotion and, and almost like violent brushstrokes because mm -hmm. there's so much there's so much that's happening in this moment that I want to capture, but then also to capture, you know, the, the look on these people's faces of, you know, why was my life taken? Like, why, why did this person feel like my life did not matter? Because it did matter. How do you choose your stories? Well, there's so many things going on in the world. Uh, I, some, sometimes I'm just, you know, looking through Twitter to see what is the what is the story of the weekend, you know, what's happening. A lot of times it's so it's so it's such a monumental story that I already know what I'm gonna create, you know, before Sunday gets here. Um but a lot of times there are specific specific stories where unfortunately um a life was taken and someone happened to record it on cell phone. And so these, these stories go so viral that everybody knows what happened and can see clearly what happened. Mm -hmm. And when, when it's like that, where, you know, almost like on a global scale, the world knows what happened. Um, in those cases, I like to um, really talk about, and through my art, talk about the life of that person uh, so that we can all get a better understanding of, you know, their life wasn't about this moment that was captured on video. Their, that, was, that was a tragic end, but their life was about all of these things before. And, you know, and sometimes you can just get that sense just from a portrait of someone or, you know, it might be, you know, like Tamir Rice walking through the park, you know, just having a good time before mm -hmm. the cops showed up and, you know, murdered him for no reason. Um, this kid had a life, you know, a Tatiana Jefferson playing video games with her nephew. She had a wonderful life. And um, tragically, all these things a lot of times end up getting cut short. Um, but I just want to, I just want to usually show uh, the life of, you know, whoever it might be that, uh, is not here to speak for themselves anymore. Yeah. And you've said uh, something. Uh, you said, I would love to make joyful stories of America. I love this country. I think that's patriotism. Isn't it hard to be a patriot in such an environment at the moment for you? Well, that's, that's, that's why I say that I feel like, um, I feel like creating, creating art about I feel like creating art about these lives is is patriotism because you're you're shouting out for justice for all. I think I think uh, a lot of times in America, the the definition of patriot has become so twisted that you know uh, there there's propaganda around um, what you can and can't say to be a patriot, and if you and if you protest. Um, in support of Black Lives, you know, some some you know, conservative outlets will say yeah, you're not a patriot, but in actuality, I feel like that is true patriotism. Like that, our 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 you know, our Constitution, our songs, they all they all speak to justice for all. And so, if you are advocating for justice for everyone, then that should be the true level of patriotism. So. All right. Thank you so much for that definition and um, for talking to us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. From the West Coast, let's go to the East Coast of America and speak to interdisciplinary artist Kambui Olujimi. Hi, Kambui. So, um, 
while many people grieve the loss of George Floyd, um, your grieving actually began in uh, 2014. Tell me what happened back then. Oh, um, you're talking about the death of my guardian angel. There was yes. a woman named Catherine Arline who was influential in me as a person, as, a, as an artist, um, and as a community member and citizen. Um, she was a pillar of the Bedford-Stuyvesant Brooklyn community, the city of New York, and she passed in 2014. And that's when I started really working in ink and um, beginning a project called Walk With Me, which is a, a tribute both to her, but also thinking about the process of remembering and thinking about how um, commemoration is not just a single action. Commemoration is a is a long process that we, you know, get a chance to return to over and over again. So for the last five years, I've been working on um, more than 100 paintings commemorating her mm -hmm. and her move to New York City. Yeah, and um, you also have created ink on paperworks uh, detailing the burning of the third precinct in uh, Minneapolis, I think. So that happened recently. Why was it important for you to respond to what happened there? Well, it was really kind of unprecedented, but it was also um, the kind of straw that broke the camel's back in a lot of ways in terms of systemic oppression and uh, racism specifically in America and American history. Um, and watching the overflow and of emotions and all throughout the country. You know, in the United States, more than 140 cities had protests. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. kind of, that's kind of uh, mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to capture that moment as history has a way of just washing um, events, especially events like this, away. Yeah. So I want to make something that couldn't be forgotten in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Yeah. Um, Kambui, let's just go back to the moment where you saw those images. How did it make you feel? Well, it was, it, it sort of, it doesn't start with that image. It, I mean, for me, the day before, there were protests and it brought up a lot of ideas. I did some writing and just thinking about how normalized this brutality had become so much so that it's very common that most black men get a, a, a speech from their fathers about how to move around police because it is a life and death because there's somewhere, there's an institution that dehumanizes you and it could mean the end of you. So like young black boys all get kind of indoctrinated with, you know, how to talk with your palms out, like all these different things that are really perverse. The day that was the day, so I was writing about that. So I was writing about that the day before. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I'm, you know, watching, um, watching the protests and watching it start to burn. And I'm on the phones with people, I'm like in conversation with people across the country from LA to uh, Chicago to Minneapolis and watching it live, like not on a news feed, just watching it live um, from people who are streaming it. And it just seemed like an image that I had not seen before. And it felt like uh, a number of different feelings all at once. like. Uh, people were speaking in many different languages all at once and I wanted to find a way to harness it. So I just worked through the night and in the morning we had it. Yeah. Okay. So it is a very touching subject, very personal and very political on many levels. How do you feel when non-black artists or, or white artists respond to what's going on uh, supporting the Black Lives Matter movement? For example, Banksy. Banksy said, uh, Banksy responded to this with an artwork and he said that it was a white problem. And um, he actually said this, let me read this from my notes. At first I thought I should sh just shut up and listen to black people about this issue, 
but why would I do that? It's not their problem, it's mine. How does it make you feel? Um, I, for me, I mean, Banks, uh, uh, um, I'm less inclined to comment on another artist. I think it's it's more important, like, what is it that he actually said? You mm -hmm. know, like, in the work. I understand the, the, the rhetoric or the speech around the work. Um, and I do think that white Americans have a lot of work to do in this country to address this issue. And I think it, the construct of, of race and racism in this country does come from, you know, uh, white people. Mm -hmm. But the work itself, I don't, my energies right now are not really focused towards, like, focused towards, you know, interpreting, because I also haven't seen it. So for me, mm -hmm. it's, um, it, I don't think I have enough to really comment on it. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us today. That's it for this homemade edition of Showcase. We have so much more on our YouTube, Instagram and Twitter accounts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Goodbye.